TikTok is an app that's completely different than any other social media platform that we've ever seen before. I went viral for the first time when I was 16 years old. I was a struggling artist. Now I have 54 million followers. Last year, they reported they had over 2 billion users. You have brands poised to spend over $15 billion in the next year on influencer marketing alone. Social media influencer was the fourth highest aspiration among elementary school students. I live in a pretty constant state of anxiety. When I'm being abused or harassed online, it's almost impossible for me to step away because this is what creates financial stability for me. Within a couple hours, that algorithm knows who you are. I thought I had the freedom of speech. The algorithms are reinforcing social disparities. How is it that my followers are not seeing my video? What's up with the algorithm? TikTok rarely deletes content. They don't have to. They can just hide it. This is blatant shadow banning. From a nation state's perspective, data is the new oil. TikTok became this symbol in this huge geopolitical storm between the US and China. I can't attribute that to just being a glitch. To me, this is bigger than TikTok. It's about who in our society gets hurt. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shalini Kantaya and I'm the director of TikTok Boom. And I am so excited um, about the conversation we're about to have on shadow banning and to host this panel in celebration of the premiere, the television premiere of TikTok Boom on PBS's um, award-winning series, Independent Lens, tonight at 10 p.m. and afterwards on PBS streaming and um, hosted by Women Make Movies, our educational distributors. And I'm so grateful, it takes so long to make a film and I'm so grateful to the cast and the crew um, for allowing me um, the privilege of bringing this story to you. Um, I just wanna share for myself that uh, like millions of Americans, I started using TikTok during the pandemic and I was astonished and a little terrified about how addictive and sticky uh, this recommendation algorithm was and how it seemed to know my unique quirks and interests and um, sort of garner my attention, hold my attention uh, for hours on end. And at the same time, as I was sort of learning about this social media app that was gaining um, popularity with Gen Z, uh, and had become the center of like dance memes, I started hearing about it as the center of a national security controversy. And I began to wonder how in the world does a, a, a social media app best known for teenagers dancing um, become a flashpoint of geo contra uh, geopolitical controversy from the two biggest superpowers in the world. And so that sort of set me on the journey to make this film. And in the making of this film, I'm so grateful um, to have featured the voices of so many Gen Z influencers on TikTok who have inspired me and shared their hopes and their heartbreak the hope and heartbreak of um, finding success on these on these platforms. And I think the subject that we're here today to discuss has amazing relevance, which is about who gets heard and who doesn't. Um, part of the journey of, tick, uh, of in the making of TikTok, I was on the boulevard with Spencer X and just saw that it, it was like being on the boulevard with like, uh, George Clooney or, or a, uh, Brad Pitt. It was like a first name celebrity. And at the same time, there are moments where we feel like no one is seeing our posts. And so, um, today we're here discussing shadow banning, 
um, and we'll define that in the conversation that we're about to have. But it's really about who gets heard and who doesn't get heard on social media platforms like TikTok. Um, although the 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 some of the issues that we're going to discuss today are not specific to TikTok. And I couldn't be more grateful to have two cast members from TikTok Boom, um, starting with the amazing uh, TikTok creator, Emily Barber, who is an ocularist apprentice and a TikTok creator from Pittsburgh. Um, she gained popularity on the, on the platform through showcasing her work, Fabricating Prosthetic Eyes, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and is featured in TikTok Boom. And also David Ryan Polger, who is a pioneering tech ethicist, a responsible tech ethicist, an expert on ways to improve social media and our information ecosystem. He's also a lawyer mm -hmm. and uh, the founder and leader of All Tech is Human. He's created a unique grassroots meets traditional power structure model that is uniting thousands of individuals across the globe to create a better tech future. So welcome, David and Emily. Thank you so much Good for being here. Today. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm so excited to talk about this thing called shadow banning because mm -hmm. I feel like we've all had this moment where we're interacting with a program like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook mm -hmm. and we're like, I feel like this post is awesome and it's not getting to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so Emily, from your perspective as a creator, yeah. um, what it, it's not in the urban dictionary yet, but it will <laughs> be. What is shadow banning? Uh, shadow banning is kind of the process of, you know, the algorithm, the app itself, uh, hiding your content from people who may want to view it, whether that's people on your For You page or people who actually follow you. And will you just talk a little bit about what your own experience was on TikTok, how you started using it and how you, the, the first time you went viral? Yeah. Um, so I started using TikTok just for fun uh, in November of 2019, I suppose. So I got in just before the pandemic really started. Um, and I started sharing uh, just little videos of things that I was doing at work, making prosthesis. I had fabricated a, a prosthesis that could go into my own eye. And I had uh, inserted that into my eye and taken a video. And I posted that video one day and it went viral. Within a couple of uh, days, I had, you know, tens of thousands of followers and, you know, it ramped up into the millions. So that's, that was kind of my first taste and it was pretty much right when I started using the, the app itself. So you're like an ocularist, you have sort of this obscure art form mm -hmm. of creating prosthetic eyes and all of a sudden you have a million followers. Mm -hmm. How did that make, just like make you feel? Uh, I think, you know, for the artistry of it all, I was really, really happy because this is such a niche field. Not many people know about it. And then of course you have so many people who, uh, you know, wear a prosthesis, whether it's, you know, a, an eye or, you know, hands, legs, things like that. And it was just kind of normalizing the process and as well as kind of giving them like a behind the scenes look as uh, things that we do in the office. Um, so I thought it was really good from an informational standpoint. I was, you know, I was glad to show people the, the behind the scenes process. It was really, really interesting, mm -hmm. but it was still kind of, you know, a little strange, but I was happy to share what I knew. <laughs> with, with a big audience. And, yes. And from that sort of um, newfound fame, mm -hmm. tell me when you first started hearing about shadow banning and when you felt that you had experienced it yourself. Uh, well, for me, shadow banning is something that's kind of traveled across platforms. I've definitely seen people, you know, saying things on um, Twitter. I was a Tumblr user for a while and, and people would talk about uh, being shadow banned on Tumblr for uh, a, a minute there. But when it came to my own experience, I, I, I guess I didn't realize how, um, powerful the actual app was and how they could just take an entire you know an entire hashtag and just hide it from the world mm -hmm. so when you know the the protests were ramping up in may of 2020 and i was speaking about that and how um 
it was affecting people and, you know, things to do. That's when I really started uh, experiencing shadow banning for the first time because I was veering away from my normal, you know, the eyeball content. Um, and I mean, it just happened to me a couple of weeks ago. I posted a video and it was up for three hours and there was no views and no interaction, nothing. And, you know, you just kind of you shrug your shoulders and take it down every once in a while. So, um, you know, it's something that still is ongoing since the last time that I've seen you, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of, I guess the best word I could think of is, is jarring because, you know, for an app to have that much power to silence an entire group of people is really, uh, it's really something. So during the Black Lives, Lives Matter protest, there was a, mm -hmm. There was a glitch basically mm -hmm. that showed the hashtag Black Lives Matter had zero views. Yeah, zero videos. Yeah, zero views. And you also had the experience of posting political work mm -hmm. and um and then basically feeling like it had no views when you had tens of thousands of followers. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. 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 And so what did it feel like? What is the experience of shadow banning feel like? Like, you know, when did you feel like, oh, this is shadow banning? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I feel it's one of those things within 10 minutes, you know, you're being shadow banned, you know, especially if you have enough followers. I mean, at that point I had more followers than I have now, but within, you know, a, I'd say at the max half an hour, you'll know if you're being shadow banned because you just won't have any traction. And it's really kind of, you know, heartbreaking because you have this platform that is, you know, making money because I am creating things and I am feeding into it. And for them to kind of just cast off the reason why they are as big as they are, you know, casting off thousands of creators um, for whatever reason, I know it's like the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, political things, you know, even you have people who are shadow banned because of developmental things, you know, disabilities. And it's just kind of, um, I don't think it's necessarily a good road to go down. I don't think it's a good practice to keep. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it's morally uh, questionable and it's just, it's heartbreaking as a creator, you know, I don't know any other word to really say, but it's just it's disappointing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard creators like um, you actually talk about it yeah. as like, you feel like you're being silenced. Yes. Yeah. Your yeah. voice is not being heard. And I think mm -hmm. one of the issues that we're having as in our democracies, our conversations, our public squares are moving to platforms like uh, Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. Twitter and TikTok. And yet um, we don't have the same values around free speech. And you point that out, David, in the film. Um, um, David, you are a tech ethicist. Before we talk about you know, shadow banning, can you just talk a little bit about what is content moderation and how it gets decided on social media platforms like TikTok? Yeah, uh, content moderation falls under the kind of emerging field of trust and safety, which has exploded in recent years. You'll notice if you kind of step back, every time a social media platform has uh, any type of issue or controversy, especially early on with Facebook before Meta, it was always, we're going to hire more trust and safety people. Content moderation specifically is done with a mixture of human uh, moderators, but also uh, artificial intelligence. It's a mix of both of those. Early on, kind of with the rise of social media, there was a lot of uh, attention and enthusiasm about the benefits of uh, artificial intelligence and its role in, in, in moderation. Uh, but uh, just generally speaking, the tricky part is speech is nuanced. Shalini, I'll, I'll give you an example. A lot of times we have to complicate some of these issues with, with speech online. For example, if somebody said, do we allow the worst of the worst, child pornography on social media, then everybody would, would be up in arms and say, well, of course not, that's a clear ban. But the truth is when you, when you think about it, if you take a photo like Napalm Girl from the Vietnam War, that was a scenario when it did get taken down a bunch of years ago off of Facebook, it became a big controversy because 
because it was how dare this piece of content that is politically significant and political speech is usually at the center when we think about free expression. How dare that platform take down something that is politically significant. However, if you look at that specific content, that content is an underage naked female. So the tricky part when you're dealing with content moderation mm -hmm. is there's no simple answer. In addition, when we think about areas like free expression, one, it gets complicated because when people use the term free speech, free speech in the United States uh, applies to what the government can and cannot do when we, when we look into how it's written in the Constitution. Granted, the tricky part is now many individuals on platforms are relating to the platform and their power in a kind of quasi-governmental capacity because the traditional role has shifted from governments that would, with our three, three branches of governments, right, kind of uh, determine what the rule, rules are, execute them, and then interpret them, right? So you have the executive branch, judicial branch, uh, and uh, the legislative branch. But what's happened is now in platforms, we've shifted a lot of this power unintentionally. It's not something like platforms would want this power because at the end of the day, platforms want to sell people ads, right? They want to make more money. Safety by its very nature is not something that's making a platform money. It's costing a platform money. Both sides of the political aisle in the United States are upset with every platform, right? So it's, it's, it's really in between a rock and a hard place. So one of the areas that, that you're focused on right now with content moderation is how do we create this Goldilocks zone? What is appropriate speech online? Because everyone has a different definition of what is appropriate. For example, a big area in, in content moderation that has always perplexed people is the, uh, the idea of free the nipple, is what's the distinction between a male nipple and a female nipple? Mm -hmm. So on one hand, you have the repression of sexual expression, which Tumblr was mentioned earlier, Tumblr, right? They got in a, a big issue because a lot of their, of their kind of fan base was based on non-traditional sexual expression. But that in itself, because they're controlled by kind of Apple and you have to be in the Apple store in order to get a lot of traction, because that offended their uh, uh, sexuality kind of, kind of limitations, they got taken off the Apple store and then Tumblr had to make a decision do they change? Do they moderate their content differently? So Tumblr said, all right, now we're going to knock off a lot of this kind of nudity that we were allowing before. But once they did that, their kind of fan base started, started heading out the door, right? So you realize that this is not an easy issue. I think one of the misconceptions that happens around content moderation is the, the general public wrongly, in my opinion, thinks that there's a magic button that we can hit. There is no magic button. This is the part of the political process. And when we think about free expression in the kind of public square or the offline kind of, kind of capacity, we're always fighting about what, what is appropriate speech. Likewise, we're always going to be fighting about what appropriate speech is and is not on, on a social media platform. I, I think, um, and I think that's right. We'll always argue about what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. We'll have different views about it. I think the difference is, is that these decisions happen in private in ways that we cannot appeal on these social media platforms. For Rosa Aziz, who couldn't join us today, um, you know, it was a 17 year old teenager who uh, made a post about Uyghur Muslims mm -hmm. and got banned from the site of TikTok. Mm -hmm. And they said it was a moderation error and she didn't know. And so I think what is so difficult is so much of this work is done in the shadows mm -hmm. in places that we don't know. And so I know that there's a push for more transparency and accountability, but what do we know? I mean, there's rules and accountability at most companies around content moderation that people have to follow. Yeah. And then there's this army of automated and human content moderators who have mm -hmm. to like field content. I think what is tricky with TikTok and why it came under the crosshairs, particularly with, for, with the story for Rosa Aziz in our story, is it came into question, it was the first time that we had a social media company that was owned by ByteDance, a company mm -hmm. in China. 
Mm-hmm. And it was the first time that we saw a social media company come from a place, a country that was not democratic, that was authoritarian. Mm-hmm. And what I found as a, as a filmmaker, uh, kind of explosive, <laughs> were these whistleblowers who came forward and said as late as 2019, there was a reporting by Netzpolitik in Germany that they were getting these crude derivatives from Beijing saying uh, ban LGBTQ voices, ban people with disabilities as a way of protecting them from bullying. Mm-hmm. And, and in another sort of explosive um, uh, reporting by Intercept Brazil, another whistleblower reported that that separate from this policy against bullying, just to grow their policy, they were hiding people they can see they they deemed were ugly or mm-hmm. obese or mm-hmm. uh, were in poor environments. Yeah. And so it and uh, all of the whistleblowers sort of report the journalists report seeing this sort of Mandarin with this <laughs> translation. And so what I think, and, and since then, I think it's important to say that TikTok has said, we have did since ourselves, we do things in a much more local way. We have a trust and moderation council. Mm-hmm. Emily, maybe you can speak to what they said about Black Lives Matter. But I think certainly because we know it had these content moderation policies, mm-hmm. where they were, um, and you know that Doyen in China does does not like to show protests. Mm-hmm. That what happened to you, Emily, where you felt like they were not showing Black Lives protests. Mm-hmm. Um, um, on their platform, or not showing the number of views. Right. right. It, it it sort of makes you scratch your head and say, "Is this connected in some mm-hmm. way?" But I think what is behind it all, and we'll never know, is like the magic sauce of these algorithms Mm -hmm. and how a tiny tweak can silence or magnify um, voices around the world. And what should we be demanding from these companies around fairness to that that global microphone? Shalini, if I can jump in just a yeah. quickly about your statement around, and it's a big part, right, of the film right. with that, uh, you know, certain people who are deemed non-attractive, right? And that was a major, right. major story. Mm-hmm. If you take a step back, though, you can really realize how complex this issue is, because if you just view it one dimensionally, you say, my God, that insinuation is really strong. We really think of saying, do they just want beautiful people on the platform, right? It's this really strong insinuation. Whereas let's let's unpack that for a little bit. Let's imagine today after this, this live stream, I get into a, a car accident and then I'm disfigured, okay? So now we have to determine, let's imagine, you know, so then I, I post something on any platform. With the content moderation, you would have to decide, okay, well, what's the foreseeability of cyberbullying. This is where every platform is trying to determine the happy medium or Goldilocks zone mm-hmm. of paternalism. Because on one hand, if you had a, a, a group mm-hmm. of individuals, right, who we would say that would have a certain sensitivity or maybe a higher propensity of cyberbullying. So let's imagine again, now I jump on the platform, I, I, I have this, this disfigurement. And what do you think is going to happen when I, when I post? Well, there's always going to be some troll, right? Some idiot who is going to say, I can't believe this guy, you know, and, and then saying really hurtful things that would crush my soul. So think about this for a minute. So we have to determine, do I lean in and, and respect my human agency to say, screw the trolls, let this guy go viral? Right. So maybe maybe it gets 10 million views, but I also get harassment. Right. I also get a form of of really mean statements Mm -hmm. that hurt me as an individual. So where a lot of that story actually derives from is that behind the scenes, you're always going to have disagreements about the intent of a speaker and the human agency versus the impact on the community and the foreseeable harm that could be done to a group, especially marginalized communities. 
So that's the, the tricky situation that's actually happening behind the scenes. Again, if we just boil down to one dimension, we say, oh, wow, they only like pretty individuals. Whereas if, we, if you had a story where, where somebody uh, who, who had some type of uh, recognizable visual issue went viral, but it also led to harassment, that in itself would be a media story. So you actually have a media story, whether it goes viral, viral or whether it, it gets throttled, because either way, people are upset. Again, this is a complex issue. So just to kind of circle back, the, the larger, larger kind of concern is going to be, how do we ensure that these decisions are made in kind of a uh, accountable fashion and that they're transparent and that they're fair? A lot of the language that we, that we use are very similar to, to the rise of a democracy. We, we talk about transparency and accountability. Even when we look at what's happened in recent years with the Facebook Supreme Court, the Oversight Board, and, and even what I'm on with the Content Advisory Council, these are really forms of, of trying to separate and think about the different branches of government because you have the legislative branch, which, uh, which is effectively the terms of service and the community guidelines. But then you do have an ability you mentioned kind of a, 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 this appellate process, this appeals process. So that's another part of it. How does an individual know how their content is being treated and what recourse do they have? So all platforms, TikTok included, are increasing the amount of the appellate process, you know, of, of just thinking about it. And then just even the judicial kind of side of it. How do we kind of interpret this? And then just quickly, I will say, one of the things that I've realized in my position with, with Altex Human and just talking to thousands of people is that, individuals, right, like Emily, we're viewing content moderation in a hyper-personalized manner because it's happening to us and it's connecting with our expression, which is incredibly important to us. And also it's usually tied in with our financial livelihood. So from an individual's uh, you know, standpoint, every decision made is incredibly sensitive and important. However, sometimes an individual thinks wow, you know, TikTok <laughs> looked at my content and, and they spent a half an hour debating about it, right? That's not scalable. So one of the, the tough parts that's happening is decisions are made in, in kind of a large scale capacity for, for millions and millions of people and pieces of content. But at the same time, an individual is affected on a one-to-one -one manner and they kind of assume similar to how you would have it in a uh, traditional public square, that they have a form of like going in front of a, a judge and arguing their case, right? We're kind of expecting that because if you see how people are, are relating to this issue, they think of it as if, as if, you know, a company is just like actively involved in their life when in fact it's, it's this very large scale kind of platform. Mm -hmm. Emily, did you feel like you had power to appeal your process when you felt shadow banned? Did you feel like there was no. like a court of appeals where you could like send a note and be like, hey, I feel like no one's seeing my thing. Yeah. Or, no. <laughs> right. And I and I feel the same happened with uh, Feroza, but they did no. eventually apologize and gave her account back. Yeah. For her, she felt like we were at the whims, our voices were at the whims and fancies and yeah. these and David, I understand what you're saying. I mean, no. I'm sure Donald Trump would say Twitter is super unfair about mm -hmm. their jurisdiction of what free speech is. Mm -hmm. But I think the issue is, is that we don't have any common um, bar and we have no, no transparency mm -hmm. and we can't look under the hood mm -hmm. and we'll never know if millions of, if that was a glitch that happens to right. millions of black creators um, we'll never know if it was a glitch that happened to Feroza Aziz that that banned her from the platform, mm -hmm. or if the Uyghurs were on their sensitive list, um, you know, and that became a, a a sensitive word to throw her off the platform. Mm -hmm. We just will never know, and so all we can do, and I think that is part of what is at stake here, yeah, of course. is that these are black box algorithms that we cannot question, and so. Um, David, I totally understand what you're saying around the difficulties, even in a free society, even yeah. when you're dealing with um, a forum that does have to do with free speech, you know, how we might disagree with each other. But now we're dealing with big tech that mm -hmm. literally has no accountability to us. Mm -hmm. And what is worse is, um, I, I think also is how these algorithms can keep us in the, in our own rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that is one of the other things I want to touch on in this conversation. Um, because I really love speaking to people who think differently than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, It's something that I really enjoy, respectful debating of ideas. I feel like it makes me a better thinker. It it strengthens my views or challenges me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I worry about in social media is that these recommendation algorithms are sending us down these rabbit holes And one of the things that we learn is like TikTok is gathering information about what you, what it thinks you are, Mm -hmm. what it thinks it it will hold your attention. And Mm -hmm. it's the same recommendation in YouTube. And it's maybe that TikTok just does it better. It's highly, Mm -hmm. highly, highly powerful recommendation algorithm. Um, But is that dangerous in giving us exposure to ideas, different ideas when we have these sort of gatekeepers. And the other thing I just wanna say that we haven't, uh, we, why don't we touch on that? Cause I'll, before I bring up another big point about, you know, do you, do you feel like you're being served up the same content? And Emily, I'd love to hear just as a creator, mm-hmm. do you feel like you're part of the strength of TikTok is that it's serving you to, com- to, to your content, to creators like you, mm-hmm. but you feel mm-hmm. in some ways that it's keeping you in a rabbit hole or that you're getting exposed mm-hmm. to different ideas and things. Uh, I feel like to some degree, it does keep you in a rabbit hole. You know, it's kind of, you know, like things go with one another type deal, mm-hmm. um, which to a degree, you know, when you're talking about cyberbullying and you, you know, the trolls and everything like that, it's nice to kind of have your little bubble where like, I could say this thing and I can get opinions of people who aren't just going to, you know, say whatever because it's the internet and I don't know who they are. Uh, But in the same sense, I don't feel as though for me personally, or even, you know, with some people who I have, you know, mutual connections with on the app, I don't feel as though we get out into the algorithm as as often. Um, And I've personally, just in the last couple of months, tried, you know, maybe if I change this up, maybe if I, you know, display this in a different way, but it's almost as if, you know, you have the, you know, the letter A, you know, scarlet letter on your account. And, you know, I am kind of just stuck in the rabbit hole that I have now, which isn't too bad. You know, I, it's, it's fine. I've learned to deal with it, but I do think that there is a good and a bad to kind of getting stuck in there. And once you're in there, you're kind of, you're there. That's where you live now. And I've heard a lot of young people talk about gaming the algorithm. So they mm-hmm. see that. Yeah. Um, but I think this has real implications for democracy and, mm-hmm. and kind of conversations we're having and the kind of mm-hmm. civility that we have with one another and mm-hmm. um, how we respect people who think different than us. Um, uh, David, do you, as a lawyer, no. <laughs> do you have any hope Look, it feels like we have our democratic values here and mm-hmm. then we have big tech here and that the nature of big tech feels authoritarian mm-hmm. because all of the power is on one side. All of the power is opaque to us. All of the power is in sort of these invisible algorithms that are showing us content and we don't know why. Mm-hmm. Um, How do we bring the balance um, back? How do we get some power back as citizens? And is there anything we can do if we feel like we've been shadow banned? Well, I think this is where, uh, you know, I've been involved the last couple of years about all these different stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. And just over the last five years, let's say, there's been a big kind of finger pointing, right? Like, every group is upset with the other group, right? So like, if you're, if you're tech companies, you're saying, okay, well, how come the legislature, how come the legislative branch or, or you know, the, the, the policymakers, how come they're not more proactive in this space and setting these rules? And if, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, the, the parents or, or, you know, youth, you're saying, well, wait a minute, what's, what's my say in this? How do I get involved in this space? So I think where it's actually headed is a form of kind of like multi-stakeholder collaboration and specifically around kind of the policy side of deciding what exactly is a social media platform. So we have right now the Supreme Court is going to be, uh, you know, 
hearing uh, a case related to Section 230. Section 230 is the most consequential law for social media platforms. So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which generally speaking, outside of a few kind of exceptions around child sexual abuse material, uh, is focused on saying that because platforms are hosting kind of user-generated content, that they are going to, to generally have a sense of immunity outside of that. If you actually take a step back, you, a lot of times that surprises people, right? Every platform uh, that, that, that allows communication is on a different kind of part of the spectrum. For example, if we think about a telephone company, we might have two terrible people, two neo-Nazis talking to each other on a telephone company. But no American would argue that the telephone company should take out their call, right? Even though theoretically you could have a, a form of surveillance where it could take out that call, which would be, which would be limiting and reducing bad behavior, which we could agree is, is terrible behavior. And I think for social media platforms, we're always trying to decide, is it this kind of public square or is it this kind of amalgamation? In addition, because media is right in the name, there's a lot of confusion because a media company has editorial kind of uh, capacity, which means that they have a lot of, of kind of restrictions on what is posted. And they have a lot of ramifications if bad content is, is posted or harmful content is, is posted. Uh, but really where I kind of see this, this kind of headed is that we as a society need to collectively kind of define the rules of the road to say to social media companies, like, here's your, here's your, your rules, right? And then stick with it. And I think one of the, the complexities that's happened is a lot of tech founders, wrongly in my opinion, or even major kind of luminaries like Elon Musk, refer to social media as a modern public square, right? And they say it was a public square. But I think what's happened is we have just psychologically shifted into thinking of social media platforms as public squares, when in fact there's little infrastructure that would be similar in nature to a public square. Because an actual public square is through a democratic system of representative government where you can vote people in and out of office. So a citizen has a say in, in their laws. Mm -hmm. Whereas now that it's shifted, if we've shifted speech, a lot of speech over to social media platforms, these are not public squares, they're commercial spaces. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the rub. How do we have a public square inside of a publicly traded company, right? Like that's, that's the difficulty. We and, sometimes and think of it in terms of this, this governmental capacity. And again, that might cause it to shift legally eventually in that direction. But right now it's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a mess because everybody kind of has a different thought about these rules. Even again, politically speaking, both sides of the aisle, left and right, are upset, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Democrats want more moderation, and Republicans want less moderation. So, and then you have it from a geopolitical standpoint, where Europe is saying, if you don't take down this content, you will be financially penalized. And then you have a state like Texas, which is saying, if you take down this content, you will be financially penalized. So the, the, the slide that I would always yes. share. And, and just to clarify, section, hard place. section 230 is mm -hmm. uh, a part of the FCC that says that companies like Facebook and Twitter and social media companies aren't responsible for what they post, for the truth of what they post on their platforms. And in other words, there are more laws that govern my conduct as an independent filmmaker uh, making no. films like TikTok Boom than there is uh, on um, companies like Facebook to make sure that they're, um, um, you know, having accurate information about the pandemic, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're seeing um, more and more people, this growing anger around, we don't want flat earth theories. We don't want this kind of misinformation spreading and should these companies be more liable for their for their content but it's multi-dimensional though because again to your point around misinformation especially yeah. with covid if on one hand if there was covid misinformation as we define it you and i then somebody would say this platform better take it down this could kill people misinformation with covid can actually cause real life consequences 
But then it's what I like to refer to as the paradox of power. For any platform like TikTok, to act and take down that content is to exert power that, that doesn't have any general moral authority because it wasn't yeah. done through a democratic body where you're voting people in and out of office. So a platform acts and then, they're, then the right of America says it's an abuse of power. If they don't act, then the left side of America says, I can't believe that they're allowing this kind of misinformation. This is terrible for uh, democracy or some conception over what a shared truth is, right? So that's a part that really needs to be emphasized. Either direction right now is going to upset one political party. So all social media platforms, and this is again, complicated by the fact that they're geopolitical, they're, that they're international, right? Everybody's unhappy because there's a major difference of philosophy over how much regulation and take it back another step. As much as we focus on, on TikTok and Twitter and Meta and Snap, well, what about platforms that are that are a layer beneath that that are saying, no, we're gonna not have any, we're not having any type of you know regulation, right? We're not going to moderate any type of content. So if you get into like Gab or Truth Social, that's a whole different side of mm -hmm. the equation. So this is a real kind of complex beast. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, um, just to bring it back, um, Emily, you know, tell me about how you felt after your experience of shadow banning, because I know it was really, uh, and there are a couple of um, questions I'm seeing in the chat mm -hmm. that are coming my way, but... Um, if you could talk a little bit about just how it made you feel, because I know when we did that interview, you were just really distraught. I mean, we, I feel like these things <laughs> are kind of wonky and like sort of high level. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, what's at stake is what we feel like is having vo our voice heard. Yes. And yeah. what happens when we live in a society where we want to critique Facebook, but the al algorithm uh, on Facebook hides it at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for how we get to challenge power in the age of big tech? Mm -hmm. And just, you know, as someone who's a member of Gen Z, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is how this is impacting young people. Yes. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, mental health is the other big theme that comes across in TikTok boom. Mm -hmm. I have a whole other conversation about that. Yeah. Again, right? <laughs> but, but I was astounded. Um, like the kids aren't all right. Like mm -hmm. they're right. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about what you see happening among your peers around mental health and social media. Um, I feel like, especially through the pandemic, the pandemic really um, exacerbated, you know, one's uh, need or want for validation outside of themselves. And a lot of people turned to, you know, social media and, you know, even more people, you know, logged into TikTok to try and find that thing that they're missing. Because obviously we had, you know, an entire generation of people whose entire lives were disrupted because of the pandemic. Um, and you, you know, at a, a pivotal time where community is everything and being with your peers, and, you know, prom and, you know, college and this, that, and the other thing. And I feel as though when you take away one's ability to even just find community on a website, mm -hmm. you know, because I, oh gosh, I hashtagged the wrong thing. And there happens to be a glitch today and now nobody's going to see it. It just makes it feel like you are completely alone while you are simultaneously getting so much information about everything that's happening outside of yourself, outside of your home. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, you know, I mean, for me personally, I feel like I felt it a lot with my, my first TikTok account. This time, I, I think I'm faring a little bit better. Thank goodness for a mental hiatus uh but it's you know a lot of people don't know 
how to step away from the social media aspect. Mm. You know, it's all they've known. I'm lucky enough that I am a part of Gen Z where I didn't have a computer for a part of my life. You know, I know how to go outside and play with toys and stuff like that, but that's not the reality for so many people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it does become very addicting. You get pulled into these algorithms. And then when it's so easy for you to get pulled in, but it's not easy to be heard with the same algorithm, mm-hmm. I feel like it just kind of creates this real uh, spiral within one's you know psyche where it's like okay so what I'm saying isn't good enough to be heard but you know this video of a cat that has seven million views is absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. it's, like, it's like you are you know you're kind of you know you're put in this public stage and you know, the public square of it all and you know, it's this way that I feel like a lot of people have been able to kind of incorrectly see how valuable they are. And, you know, it's really skewed the reality. And, and I think that is troubling about the mental impacts is that mm-hmm. we come to equate our self-worth mm-hmm. by how many followers we have or how many yes. likes we have. And what I worry about with Gen Z is that like, and why I'm so inspired by the the cast that we have of Gen Z um, influencers in the film is that they're using technology in new ways. Mm-hmm. And you are the first generation who is coming of age online. And mm-hmm. every generation of human beings after you will have come of age mm-hmm. online, like literally with the cell phone and the baby carriage. And so yeah. it feels like this massive uncontrolled experiment and almost like a massive seismic shift in our humanity Mm -hmm. um, in the the sort of evolution of our humanity with the evolution of these devices Mm -hmm. and it's changing our society and the way we connect with each other and one of the things that I began to wonder in the making of this TikTok film because for some time a third of TikTok's users were under 14 Mm -hmm. was the impact this is having on young people because we that a brain is not fully developed until like 25, 25. <laughs> or something. And so, um, you know, what does it mean when you have some of the most persuasive algorithms in the history of the world mm-hmm. collecting data about a 10 year old, right? how it can know you over right. time. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I worry about is that we've not updated the laws that protect children around online protection since the 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the Child Online Protection Act came about like before the advent of the internet, basically. (laughs) (laughs) And and so, um, and one of the reasons we don't, I think, aren't, haven't been able to regulate is because we can't get data. Mm -hmm. Even out of Instagram, we knew you know, from whistleblowers that their technology, you know, that the app was causing eating disorders in, in yeah. teenagers and they hit yeah. the data. So how can we better protect kids? And so Emily, I'd love to hear your thoughts in China. They, mm-hmm. uh, they limit teenagers. I mean, if you're under a certain age, you can only TikTok for 40 minutes a day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering what you yeah. think would help your, you know, Gen Z have uh, a relationship with social media that protects your mental health and your digital well-being. Um, oh gosh, what a large question! <laughs> because it, I mean, it's 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 like or even in your own life, what what has helped you? Yeah, I I well personally with the moderation. I mean, because I I've said I took a hiatus. You know, I completely deleted my account because it's so addicting. The only way that I could stop doing it was to completely get rid of it. And I mean, at least for me, that that helped. But that's we're talking about teenagers, you know, you can't just say, give me your phone, I'm deleting TikTok off your phone. And you can't necessarily, you know, after a certain age, you can't put their screen time on and, you know, they have to request you. But I, I feel like if you're going to have teenagers on these apps, because I was a teenager on Tumblr, mm-hmm. should not have been. Um, <laughs> and I feel like there just needs to be uh a better conversation, maybe more people in the room. Can we have some diversity in the room when we're talking about the things that we are going to allow this algorithm to do? Because essentially what you're doing is taking these people and creating an algorithm for what they deem correctly, but are you thinking of everything? You know, 
if you have a group of people who are all relatively the same, you all grew up the same, you're all the same race, relatively the same gender, maybe you grew up in the same social class, you know, the things that you find appropriate and the things that you are even knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about are vastly different from the things that I just know because of the life that I've lived. Mm -hmm. And I feel like bringing more people into the room who can, you know, share their own experience of like, this is what it was like being on the internet as, you know, a black woman or a black teenager. Mm -hmm. um, it would just, you know, kind of just broaden the horizon just even a little bit so that we can think about these kids a little bit more. But then you also have so many creators who are grown adults who are creating content that is just their child. And that's a whole different ballgame because how do I regulate a 32 year old who just wants to film their, you know, six month old all the time? Mm -hmm. How, you know, what rights does that child have? Yeah, that's, a, this is that's a whole other, we can have a whole yeah. other conversation just about this. Yeah. Before I, we, before we wrap up, David, I'm wondering if you have a few suggestions of what people can do um, in the chat. I have a few conversations about who carries out content moderation on these apps and if any of these, uh, if if the playbooks for how moderation uh, content is moderated is public uh, to all these social media companies, and if there's any way to hold uh, social media companies like TikTok accountable for the way they moderate content. Well, this goes directly into transparency reports, which TikTok and other platforms have really kind of grown in kind of having those out there and then there's usually kind of a connection with kind of the policy side of it too. The, the tricky part to your point around content moderation and policies is how do we think of both us as good actors, mm -hmm. right? Who wanna be made aware. And the fact that there are a lot of bad actors who if you made everything completely transparent, especially around how the algorithm works, then itself, would allow bad actors to exploit that. Mm -hmm. So there's always kind of this fine balance that's going to kind of happen in, in that direction. Uh, I know a few years ago uh, when, when Facebook was still Facebook, that was kind of a, a big, PR, uh, big kind of PR story when uh, certain kind of reports around kind of like slide decks that a lot of the moderators had uh, became public. And there was a real debate around just how difficult these decisions are, right? Mm -hmm. Because similar to determining if, if something is appropriate in, in kind of like a public square, mm -hmm. we have to also see how would, you, how would you execute that? For example, if you kind of create a, a rule and you say, no swearing allowed. Well, that this is one part right. of the puzzle because then you have to define, well, what is swearing? Right. And swearing generally is going to change throughout, uh, throughout time. Right. So I think that's the, the difficult part is that these are rapidly changing constantly. And then to, to make it one step more complex, the other part of the equation is that for the human moderators, that in itself is a really kind of uh, stressful position because if you think about the terrible stuff that gets posted online, somebody is cleaning up the sewer. Of, of, the, right. of the web, right? And so that's, an, that's its own kind of conversation issue. also yeah. is the content moderators who have to face this, yeah. this content. Um, we're almost out of time, so I have to wrap up. But what I do want to say is that uh, we are not powerless in these situations. And while these mm -hmm. decisions are difficult, what I feel strongly about is that they should not be left to a few stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, that they're there are creators like Emily that have been stripped of their voices or feel voiceless. And there should be some process of appeals. There should be some sort of transparency from these companies. And we should be able to give some input in the technologies that we interact with every day. Mm -hmm. um, I also just want to point out, if you go to tiktokboom.com, uh, uh, tiktokboom.tv backslash take action, there's a bunch of heroic organizations uh, that work with Gen Z, that work with mental health, that work with um, free speech, issues of free speech, mm -hmm. and you can support uh, an organization that's doing great uh, great work in this field. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, David Polger and Emily Barber for, for um, such a rich conversation about 
um, the, the platforms that, that govern our voices every day. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope everyone will tune in uh, this evening and streaming uh, for, for the uh, US uh, broadcast premiere of TikTok Boom on PBS's Independent Lens tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern. Check your local times and PBS streaming for the next year. And uh, of course, you can host a screening at your college, school, or university through Women Make Movies and, and spark a conversation about um, uh, these important issues uh, that are important to our future, um, mental health, social media, democracy, and free speech. Thank you so much for being here and um and I hope you'll watch TikTok boom. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.